Yeah, the Trinity is should be it cannot be a sideline uh, belief in Christianity. No, it's not. So you cannot have a category for it because it's it's the most, the most basic information about God. Uh, yes. A religion cannot be a religion if you don't have a central figure that people worship. Your central figure is God. So it has to have uh, a, a very clear message about him. Yeah, okay. Um, but I'm, the, the, sorry, I'm happy the, the, the problem I have with more, uh, the way some Christian put it across is that they say that, well, nobody knows God fully. This, that, is, that, this is what we I get. We probably all accept. We accept that. Okay. But this is not fully, this is basic information. That's fine. Yeah. Um, a, a moment ago, you were saying that you know, the Trinity belief, thank you, the Trinity belief has, has to be clear in the Bible. Uh, and I do agree. What I'm wondering from you is, are you saying that the full, uh, go this way. Yeah. the full detailed exposition of the Trinity, as we find in, say, the Nicene and Chalcedonian creeds, yes. is that what you mean? Or do you mean the fundamental belief that there is one God, and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? All the creeds, Nicene Creed, uh, Athanasian Creed, all these creeds, they led to what you have today. The final, okay. final cut That's version of Christianity. Are well, you saying that has to be explicit in the Bible? No. What I'm saying is that cannot lead to confusion, right? What ah. I'm saying, if I ask a Christian now, what is the concept of God in your, uh, in your, in your no. belief? No. He cannot spend ten minutes talking about Nicene Creed, Athanasian Creed. Okay. So, okay. so I, I would agree with you. I mean, in terms of the Nicene Chalcedonian Creed, I think they are good attempts to work out the, the Trinitarian relationship within God. Um, would I say they're absolutely binding upon a Christian's conscience? You have to believe that to be a Christian. That the Bible is explicit about that. Uh, no, I don't think so. Or at least not without a great a great deal of subtlety. Um, what I fundamentally think a Christian does need to believe is that there's one God, Scripture tells us to believe one God, tells us to believe Jesus is God, tells us to believe the Holy Spirit is God, and that's what we need to believe. At that fundamental basic level, I do think the Bible is clear. So where does it say to believe uh, Jesus is God, like you mentioned uh, just there? Many places. Should we have a look? Yes. Let's go for it. I'm just going to get a Bible. That's um, fine. Now, there, there are two... Um, sections within this category. There is that the New American Standard? This is the NRSV. Uh, I think the New American Standard is a great Bible. I just don't, don't have it out of heart. This is an error NRSV, which is what most universities use. Um, what, was I, what was I about to say? Talk about the Trinity. Uh, where, where shows passages. passages shows. So there are two broad categories. I mean, there are lots of passages in the New Testament that describe the deity of Jesus, often in a very clear doctrinal way. Okay. But they're about Jesus. They're not on the lips of Jesus. Right, I know okay. Muslims hear it speakers call it often like to hear it from Jesus' own mouth. Uh, I would say he claims to be God. I would say there's a good level of clarity, but I'd say for many reasons it's not as clear as other parts of the New Testament. Which would you like me to focus on? Right, so what you're saying to me is there are no verses where Jesus himself claims he's God, but there are verses attributing divinity to him. That's, that's not, no, is no, that what he's saying? no, no, no. Okay. I'm saying the clearest verses are arguably the ones spoken by other New Testament writers, mm -hmm. uh, even though I am saying Jesus, I think, you know, comparatively clearly does claim to be God, and implicitly often claims to be God. And I'm asking you, here at Speaker's Corner, when Christians are chatting to Muslims, they generally want to hear words from Jesus' own mouth. I'm wondering, which do you want me to speak about? Because you're asking for me yeah. as a Christian. Now, as a Christian, I believe in all of Scripture, so I will use both sets equally. Uh, what do you want me to focus on? This is the reason, when we began, yeah. I said about God not being the author of confusion, like 1 Corinthians chapter 14, sure. verse 33. Yeah. It says, God for God is not the author of confusion. This is why I established... I, I'm saying neither... Why can I just get... Yeah, yeah, sorry. This is why I established this beforehand. The verses you show me, are they confusing enough to be taken both ways? Uh, I would say they are not confusing enough that both would be... Um, 
kind of the, the, the good or the best interpretation. That's fine. Can I see them then, mate? Yeah, yeah. If that's the case. And, 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 and kind of even, and they would be clearer also to the first generation who knew the Jewish context, the Old Testament okay. themes and metaphors. Um, but yeah, let's, let's have a look at some. And obviously it's also clear if you read the whole of the book in question. But one example that I always go to is Mark 14, 61-64. So this is Jesus before the Jewish Sanhedrin. Yeah. But he, Jesus, was silent and did not answer. Again, he, uh, again the high priest asked him, Are you the son of the, the Messiah, one, yeah. the son of the blessed one? Jesus says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. So here, I mean, as I stress, I'd want to interpret this in context, but even within the immediate context, you know, he's not just the son, I mean, he's the son of God, the unique son okay. of God. You will see the son of man, son of man, Daniel 7, is highly exalted being, receives the worship and the service of all nations, only God has that. Seated at the right hand of the power, he sh basically he, he shares the, the divine authority in heaven, only God has that. Coming with the clouds of heaven, mm -hmm. only Yahweh does that back in ancient religion, only um, Baal did that, you know, it's, it's a divine thing to come with the clouds of heaven. Um, so this passage alone, but especially within the broader context of Matthew's Gospel, I think is, is comparatively clear. Can you stay on that passage? Yeah, yeah. Can yeah. I, maybe yeah, yeah. I want to tackle it yeah. probably from an angle you've never heard before. So forgive my ignorance if it's ignorance. The verse talks about, it says, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Yeah. Does it say that he's the Son of Man coming in the clouds? Good question. Um, so, I think virtually all scholars would say, you know, yes, Jesus claims to be the Son of Man. Uh, in, in, as the Gospels portray him, okay. he, he claims to be the Son of Man. I think there are some scholars who have disputed that historically, but I, I think that's a minority position. Okay. Um, I think Bultman may have said that. I think that's a minority, but I could be wrong. Um, there are some passages where it's much more clear. So, for example, someone says to Jesus, you know, um, uh, you know, I've got to follow after you, and he says, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Okay. He's warning this man, you know, he's, he's warning this man within my ministry, it's, it's a ministry on the road, it's not comfortable. There, there's that and many other passages where it's very clear that the Son of Man is him. All the passion predictions, you know, the Son of Man will be handed over, will be beaten, be, you know, crucified, will rise again. This is obviously him referring to himself. Let me get one question out of my head yeah. before I forget. Let's assume we switch, we switch uh, positions here. And I am the one who's using this verse to show the divinity of Jesus. Yes. Would you accept that? That uh, it is clear uh, and he's showing you this. Uh, am I a Muslim? Am I an atheist? What am I? You're an atheist. I'm an atheist. So, I mean, obviously as an atheist, I've got all my, my biases and my motivations. Um, my best, that's a great question. I think that um, if I were an atheist, with how much I you have studied subjects, yeah, yeah. I believe I would accept it, yes. However, I think that the best alternative argument to go down is, yes, Jesus is claiming to be an exalted figure, but there were other exalted figures within Second Temple Judaism. Uh, you know, I might appeal to things like the Exegoge of Ezekiel, um, Fourth Ezra, Ezra uh, Second Baruch, the, the Baruch the, these kinds of texts. Um, and that, that's a legitimate approach. To be fair, you know, a lot of scholars do go down that road. Um, the reason I don't is I'm a big fan of the work of a scholar called Richard Borkham. Okay. And he talks about a divine identity Christology. He doesn't Calvinist guy. Uh, is he a Calvinist? Not that I know of, he could be. That's not his big thing. Richard Borkham. His big thing is New Testament studies. Okay, okay. Calvinism isn't his thing. No. Um, he does a lot of work kind of, you know, looking at Second Temple Jesus. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've, I've read oh, yeah. um, I've read kind of, I forget, one or two, three of his, of his work. Sorry. Yes. And he, he basically looks at Second Temple Jewish writers and how they define God and the kind of things they talk about. And he says, you know, these Jewish authors, they don't believe in a, in a greco roman spectrum of divinity. You're either God or you're not. There's a clear God, non-God divide. And the key things are creation of the universe and universal lordship. 
and the New Testament ascribes both to Jesus, the gospel accounts describe the universal lordship to Jesus. Okay. Um, creation, uh, maybe we, we can. No, no, that. Still, still um, stick to the. To so, that. So, so that, that's why um, I think, with, with what I've studied and my understanding of Second Temple Judaism, I think a Second Temple Jew would have heard this and would have done precisely what the high priest did and cried out. But if you look at the verse, yeah. the verse says you will see the Son of Man yes. come in the clouds. Uh, see, seated at the right hand of the power, right. coming with the clouds right. of heaven. Yes. That verse doesn't clarify he's talking about himself. That's one thing I see. Yes. See, if, I, if you look at the verse from a non-Christian point of view, I see, first of all, he does not refer to himself. Okay. He says, you will see the Son of Man. Yeah. And he's not the only one called Son of Man, is it? Was Daniel called the Son of Man? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. So Daniel was called Son of Man. Did he come in the clouds? Oh, wait, hold on. So, yeah, I, I think he was, but I'm not sure if I've heard Muslims say that. I'm, I'm not sure. What I'm saying to you... Did he come in the clouds? No, I don't think he did. Did he see a vision where somebody came so in? Vision, yes. Yes, he did. Yes. So, and Jesus is appropriating that vision to himself. But this is what okay. your theolo theologians do. This is the opinion of your theologians that the, what he saw it matches Jesus. But the Old Testament, according to Jews as well, has no link with Jesus. Okay. But let's let's come to it. When he says, I mean, of course, it's been that the carry on. Yeah, that's right. Okay, obviously, you see it from uh, your theme. If, if we're just standing, should we go lead on the rail? Yes, yeah, sir. Let's make this mobile. It's just because the sun's behind you, uh, behind you, we don't see you like last time. You can rest that side. That, yeah. Is this okay? If it's yeah, a yeah. problem, I can just That's right. uh, not be so lazy. So, yeah, yeah. Well, what was I saying? Yeah, if we look at the verse, the verse doesn't talk about himself. And for me, when I, when I read, read the verse, what I see every time, every time the same. The reason, the, you know, the fact that you deduce from the reaction of somebody that you will call an enemy, because he's an enemy of Jesus. If he's an enemy of Jesus, he must be your enemy. So if you deduce from your enemy who your Lord is, then there's a problem. Right. That's one. Secondly, when he says blasphemy, it can mean anything. Blasphemy could mean that he's quoting from a verse that's blasphemous to them. If somebody, somebody who breaks the laws of Sabbath and all this quote from, how dare you quote from our, our scripture when you yourself don't have to not follow our laws? That could be what it is. And we're not sure the blasphemy here is because he's saying he's God. So be before I forget on that last point, that, that is a good point about, yeah. you know, what does the blasphemy charge mean? I've not really studied that. Okay. I think... I will not bring it into crowds like they used to. <laughs> um, I think Daryl Bock may have done quite a lot of research on the blasphemy charge okay. uh, and concluding that the scenario suggests that Jesus was making faith of divinity. I could be mistaken. Don't believe me on that. Go check me on that. I'm not sure. Uh, but yes, that's a good point. And, and generally, you're right. Christians shouldn't go, you know, oh, an enemy of Jesus is saying this about Jesus, therefore we trust Jesus as enemies. You know, Jesus' yeah. enemies are often wrong yeah. in the Gospels. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm not trying to do it on that simplistic basis. What I was trying to do is say that actually, if we study the accusation itself, it seems like he's claiming to be God. And this is secondarily confirmed by the response, because if it was a claim to be God, we would expect his enemies to accuse him of blasphemy, but not all accusations of blasphemy are necessarily justified. So it's a, it's a secondary confirmatory argument, not a primary one. The, the primary issue is, is he claiming that he himself is the son of man? You said he's, he's not in view, he's talking about the son of man. No, he didn't implicitly say, you will see me, the son of man. Right, he didn't explicitly say that. I mean, obviously the context here is you're asking him about who he is. He starts off by saying, I am, and you will see, and then they respond by calling him a blasphemy. I mean, to me, the most natural reading of that context would be to apply it to himself, but also, throughout the Gospels, talks about the Son of Man. I think it's very clear throughout the Gospels, can, can the, just, just yeah, carry on, sure. carry on, that the Son of Man is referring to Jesus. The way that certain scholars, uh, such as I think Bortman and Bart Ehrman, yeah. um, they, they claim that the Son of Man isn't Jesus. Is, I mean, it's classic kind of, you know, liberal scholarship, shopping and changing. It's saying some of these statements go back to the historical Jesus, some don't. We're not going to interpret them all together. Both, for me as an evangelical, I'm interpreting this to get my theology, how, course, how I view yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And even as a historian, 
I think it is far better as a historian not to chop up text when you can avoid it, but to an interpret an author's statements in light of himself. And when that is done, I do think it's very clear to any... No, I won't make that I do think it's very clear that um, Jesus is claiming to himself. Right. See, I have an issue here. The issue is that when we started the discussion, we said the verses that attribute divinity to Jesus. I know you mentioned a few times, if you look Matthew, if you look at the Gospel of Matthew as a whole, it points to it, you were saying. But you deliberately went to this verse. Yeah, this is one of the clearest. But would you agree that the verse is not clear? Good. What, what do we mean by clear? Is like, it? for example, a clear verse would be, for example, in the, if you look in the Old Testament, in Exodus, God in Exodus says, I am Yahweh. I'm the Lord. Beside me, there's no other. These are called clear-cut statements. Okay. You cannot interpret them but for the face value of that's, it. That's, yeah. that's actually yeah. um, What I would say is no text is 100% clear. You can always interpret the text in different ways. Even the one you just gave. Some scholars well, how, read the how Old can you interpret for, that? For yeah. With some of the statements in the Old Testament, um, some scholars say that some of those texts refer to monolatry. They don't deny the existence of the other gods, but it's saying, okay. for you, Israel, I am the only God, worship me alone. Whereas some scholars say, no, it's monotheism, it's denying the existence of other gods, um, and says that you know, Yahweh is, is the only God. But well, we're um, back to square one with that. Some say, some say, these are opinions of men. What, every, sorry, what I'm saying to you, if you take somebody who doesn't have uh, any biases and you bring them to this verse, will they interpret them the same way as you do? Some say this, some say that. Uh, Matthew, they will say, 20, they will uh, say this verse yeah. of Exodus. Wh which one? Exodus? Exodus chapter 45. Okay. When it says, I am the Lord, behind, uh, beside me there's no other. If you bring that to any person, let's say the person claiming, uh, who said this is claiming they're the only God. You cannot interpret them unless you have a particular theological line oh, no, to no, follow. No, no, no. I mean, it's a Trinitarian yeah, yeah. who say this negates the other two, but they, 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 it doesn't negate their existence, like you said. Okay. And a Unitarian will say this shows you there's no Trinitarian okay. concept in Godhead. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, okay. when you bring this verse to somebody who doesn't have these precepts and yeah. uh, these concepts beforehand. They will interpret so, them at face okay. value. So some, I mean, some texts are clear and others. Take the Son of Man one. Yeah. I think any, if you just give any old person on the street, if you give him any of the Gospels and say to him, who is the Son of Man? They'll go, Jesus. They'll say some, some references to the Son of Man are less clear, but some are very clear that it refers to Jesus. Okay. Jesus. The only way you deny that is by chopping up the Gospels and saying some of these aren't authentic, some aren't. And that's a whole other thing. Um, the Exodus one, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know as much about the Old Testament. Um, you've got if to, you've you go got to, to bring Exodus chapter 45, verse but 6. It's, it's not just yeah. about the one text, it's about saying what are the other statements about, you know. Because some people also right. say, you know, that there are, you know, talk about the other gods of the nations, but I am your God. And they'll say, well. Uh, let's check it. Okay. Isaiah yes, 45, yes. 6, yeah. In Isaiah, yeah. I don't even need to go there. Yes, Isaiah is a clear affirmation of monotheism. Yahweh is the only true God. There are no other gods. Right. Yes. So you cannot interpret it any other way? No, I don't think so. No. But the verse you quoted from Matthew 15. Uh, Matthew. The one you said that Jesus said. Son of Man. Son of okay, Man. Um, all this. So Matthew would be later. Sorry, Mark. In Mark it's 14, 61 to 64. Right, so Mark. So, can that be interpreted a different way? Uh, yes, it can. Right. Yes. So, somebody showing you God being uh, one God, no partners from the Old Testament, has clear cut verses. Say again, sorry? So, if somebody wants to show you God being one God yes. with no other partners, uh, with no other gods as partners, yeah, yes. No other partners yes. from the Old Testament, they can show you clear cut verses. Yes. But can they do that with the New Testament? With Jesus. So, with, I would probably say, no, it's not as clear. Right. So, the, the one about Yahweh being the only God, there's no other gods. I mean, I'm tempted to say that's, you know, 90% certain. Um, if you isolate this one in Mark 14, uh, 61, 64, I'd say it's, you know, 80, 85% certain. Uh, given, given the, from my studies, given the kind of context around it, when all of those Gospels are, t are taken together, we don't isolate the verse, I would then say 90% certain, 
Um, and then with the whole of the New Testament is taken, I think it's pretty, pretty certain. But th this is the amazing thing to me, that what I'm being told is God came down as a man in a geographical location, Palestine, over 2,000 years ago. And he ministered, according to the Gospels, three years, but he never claimed to be God. Right. It was attributed okay. to him. Okay. So, first of all, I do believe he came to me. So, this is one of the explicit yeah. bits. And then after his resurrection, again, I'm sorry, you might be right. Maybe I did go to Matthew earlier. I'm not sure. Uh, but, so, for example, at the end of Matthew, after yeah. he's made this exalted statement, you know, Matthew ends. Uh, so Jesus has, has been risen from the dead. When they, the disciples, saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Okay. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I command you. Remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. I mean, we've already seen a few chapters earlier the exhaustive statement I shared with you. He's now, you know, his disciples worship him. He says he's got all authority, again, according to Borkham, only God has all authority. Um, the disciples are baptized in the singular name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They obey Jesus' commands, and he's present with his disciples. He's with them Please. always. Yeah. I mean, when we add together all of the, the verses in the Gospels, I do think it's, you know, yeah, 990. There are three things you quoted there that caught my ear, hearing, for example. Firstly, they worshipped him, but some doubted, right? So there was a group there. From the group, there was a split opinion. So the other thing is, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Does God need to be given authority? Um, so we believe that the Father, that God has I'm sorry, what was the third point before I forget? Uh, I, I think I raised more than three. I mean, there's all right. being baptized no, in the singular name of the Father, okay. the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say they are one. No, fine. But, but it's the idea of, it's not the names, the names. Remember, we're going back to uh, being absolutely clear and ambiguous. Okay, no confusion. Let's, let's just tackle yeah. that issue. There are a few, to be, to be honest, almost no text is 100% clear. Okay, even the Isaiah one I quoted, there's probably a way you can interpret that in a non non monotheistic sense. It's just, it's, you've got to ask not is it possible to read this diff differently. Yeah. The question is, what is the most natural reading of this text? Both in its immediate context and the wider context. I'm not looking for 100% mathematical proof that any part of the Bible says anything. A lot of Muslims here approach it that way. As someone, you know, as a humanity student, I don't believe you can do that with texts. I believe the interpretation of texts is probabilistic. Now, some interpretations... But you have biases, though. We all do. Now, your biases are greater towards this text than somebody who doesn't believe in the text, for example. So, for example, me, I don't believe in all of the text. I don't reject all of it, because there, there are hundreds and hundreds of verses that correspond to the, with the Qur'an. Yeah. Uh, which I believe are from God, same God revealed them, that's why they're similar. So, but what I'm saying is, somebody who doesn't have this bias like you have in your concept of God, when it comes to these, these Gospels, and I have read most of them, I haven't read all of them, I have read most of them, there's not a clear-cut verse that jumps at me and says, this shows Jesus is God. If anything, he diverts attention every time divinity okay. is thrown at him. He say, for example, you talked about after the resurrection. If you go to after resurrection events, like in John, John chapter 20, those events are after resurrection. Because first day of the week, Mary goes to the tomb. Why would she go to the tomb? Because this is after resurrection. In John chapter 20, verse 17, he says, I have not yet ascended to, you, to, to, to the Father. Go to your brethren and tell them I ascend unto my Father and your Father, my God and your God. This is after resurrection. The same gospel yeah. that you know, Jesus says, before Abraham was, like, hey, I mean. But that's so not Mark clear verse. Okay. But all I'm trying to say yeah. is that verse you quote, yeah. I can yeah. throw 10 back at you. But I am is nothing. Are you, are you here, Richard? Well, we, 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 are you here? <laughs> if you answer me, I am, then I have to I, worship I am. you. I'd say, I'd say Jesus. Then I have to worship you as a God. He said, I am. Jesus is suggesting more in that context. Right, but he says, I am before okay. Abraham. He didn't I, say before I, I Adam. I shouldn't have made that comment because I'm not trying to yeah. get into a point about concept. Yeah. All I was trying to say is, you throw me a verse in John, I can yeah. go 10 back at you. But they're ambiguous. Okay, what, what do we mean by the, I can pick up the Quran. Yes. Um, th there was a scholar, I think it might be Gerkwin, the textual scholar, who basically said a fifth of the Quran is unintelligible. Uh, at least without the tradition. And, and I've tried to understand the Quran. Uh, take the issue of religious violence as Sora 9. I think that's incredibly unintelligible. Sora? Sora 9, for example. I, I try hard to understand that. 
that and other bits in the Quran, I found very uncomfortable. And I'm not talking about a, a lot of texts yeah. in the Quran. I find that the Muslim approach to the Bible, maybe it's influenced by the Muslim approach to the Quran. I feel as Christians, and also non Christians kind of in the West, modern Westerns, uh, in the individual part. We'll read the gospel kind of as a whole and we'll say, what is the sense we get of Jesus? How is the author trying to portray Jesus? When I feel Muslims, every time there's a gospel text that could suggest the divinity of Jesus, the Muslim will look at every possible other alternative, which is good to do in a sense. But there's also a sense where you've got to say, let's not always try and think of alternatives. Let's just read all the text, not stop at every point and just say when we read them all as a whole read all of the gospels in one go what is the sense we get of the gospel and i would say you know yeah i, I would i would say an unbiased reader would come to the conclusion that, that jesus can i suggest something it's fine now just say you know yes we do all have a bias and so i'll let you speak yeah that's right and yes i do have my bias but I'd say I've got two biases. I've got one bias, which has a Christian, you know, I, I want to, you know, I, I have my Christian beliefs. That will influence the way I, I, I interpret text. But also, as a Christian and as a person who comes here as Speaker's Corner, somebody studied at, you know, in academia, I'm very aware of their alternative views. And so actually, often evangelicals, or at least very kind of more academic evangelicals, we will actually try very hard to think, how else could I interpret this? Because I know if I'm wrong, and if, if Islam is right, I'm going to burn in hell forever. I don't want that. It's up to God. Okay. It's up to God. We don't say okay. you're guaranteed hellfire. Well, there are certain I, I, I acts hope, that we're guaranteed. I hope, I hope you're right. But right. I mean, I, I'm very wary of the threat of hellfire yeah. and because of that I'm actually I try my Christian friends sometimes say to me that I'm overly fair to the other side I try to be overly fair to the other right. side let's see how overly case, fair you are here yeah, in case I'm wrong because if yeah. I'm wrong I'm in big trouble as you and I both know I, I, I want to uh, correct something on the Quran then go to the Bible the Quran is not like, like the Bible the mistake that most people make is they do a direct comparison the Quran was revealed as well stage by stage over 23 years as things happen incidents happens events happened there were uh, incidents that led to specific verses relating to those events over 23 years for example Surah 9 and the, the, the quote that people make is from uh, verse 5 this is specifically related to an event called the Treaty of Hudaybiyah so it's related to an event and revelation came specifically for that yeah. the bible is not like that people forget the bible was not written by people that sat together and they knew about each other and wrote it at the same time relating to events that they said okay you put this down and i will omit it it wasn't like that people make direct comparison between quran and uh, bible and they get lost how the quran says this and the bible doesn't how does the bible say this and the quran doesn't? because you cannot make direct comparison for example mark didn't know about uh, matthew and luke writing did he probably not right. this is one thing john knew about the, the, the others writing because he came he came after that's the other gospels yeah. it's long been debated this is what i'm saying to you that the, the concept we have when we compare the Bible and the Quran is a completely a false concept because the Quran reacted to events. The Quran came to guide according to the events that happened. The Bible didn't come for that. The Bible is narrating what happened in the past. So you're right, there yeah. isn't a direct comparison. Right. We must acknowledge the differences between them. You're correct. But I still stand by my statement in that sometimes, even with the, the Asbab al Nuzul, even with knowing the, the Asbab yeah, well, there's, there's, there's still a lack of clarity. Yeah. So, so take Surah 9. Yeah. Yeah, a hot topic here at Speaker's Corner. Um, and I, I spend a lot of time just trying to understand it. I, I read through it, and on the one hand, it might be kind of nine, uh, either seven or eight. It talks about the others who have broken treaties with you. So maybe the issue here is treaty breakers. It's about Muslims defending themselves. Yeah. Well, then other parts of that, uh, those passages, seem to focus on the religious aspects of their opponents. So, Such as? So, for example, no, 929 is about attacking yes. fighting against Christians, and the following verses are all about their theological errors. Who are those groups? Just, just, yeah. speak, just speak for a moment. So, even given all the context, yes. which I'm gradually What's learning, it's still unclear in the text God, itself when you're dead, whether you're the dead. emphasis is okay. on their, their bad religion or that they're treaty breakers, or maybe that they're treaty breakers because of their bad religion. So, I would say to me, 
it's still actually quite unclear. But also, there are many parts of the Quran where people will disagree about the Asbab al -Busur. People say, some say this is the historical circumstance, some say this is it. So even with the Quran, both uh, both in the text and in the um, supporting text to interpret the Quran, I'd still say for, for me as an outsider, there's still a lot of confusion. Now, let me ask you a question then, eh, based on that. Say, for instance, Jesus narrated to Mark, Matthew, Luke and John. They were with him there. He narrated to them and they wrote it. And then he came from him and they wrote it directly. Would that have more authority now? For me as a Christian? Yeah. For most, most Christians. Uh, that the Gospels you read are directly from the mouth of Jesus. So actually I, I would say no. The, the re the, yeah, uh, okay. Obviously for you as a Muslim, what we believe as Christians is that all of Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So Jesus' words... But historically... Okay. But Jesus' words... Yeah. And to be fair, some Christians focus so much on the words of Jesus, they in their practical outworkings they might actually disagree with them. but so you know Jesus um, Jesus is God the Son when Jesus speaks it is God speaking to us the Spirit is the third member of the Trinity when the, the Spirit speaks in Scripture it's God speaking to us both of them are God speaking to us therefore I would say both are equally authoritative now don't get me wrong um, if Jesus you know just sat down and dictated certain things would certain things have been clearer maybe mm -hmm. um, but that's that's not how it was done right this is my point this is exactly what I wanted you to say things will be clearer maybe right we have this in Islam okay. right so when you have the verses that you say are ambiguous and this and that who revealed these verses uh, a lot who revealed them to, to, to the companions the messenger. The verses came through Muhammad. Right. This is what I'm saying. That we have these verses coming directly from the messenger who explain them to us. Some of the ones are ambiguous. The, the, the differences you talk about do not uh, add any the, the difference to the basic knowledge of God okay. and what we're meant to do with this knowledge. So that basic knowledge does not change. So I, I, For example, you go to anywhere worldwide, whichever group, they do not deny God is Allah. They do not deny that Allah has no partner, except some deviant groups. Except some small deviant groups, they would associate partners in human beings that they take from their forefathers. But the basic knowledge of God and what we attribute to God should be the same. So when the Prophet reveals a verse, we have hadith that follows it, that explains to you. For example, I'm going to give you an example. When Allah says, establish prayer and give zakat, wa atimu salata wa atu zakat. How do you establish prayer? How do we pray? you pray? How many times? Yes. How many do. times? What Absolutely. do we do? How do we pay zakat? Who pays it? What's the percentage? Does everybody has to uh, have to pay this? So these information, we cannot leave it to scholars. We cannot say, oh, so-and-so scholar said it's 10%. Another scholar says 1% of your earnings, yearly, uh, yearly uh, earnings above what you need is to be paid zakat. As zakat. No. Okay. The Prophet, in his time, was the actual uh, model of this Qur'an in a human form. So he lived and breathed Qur'an. People through his actions know what is required, what these verses mean. We don't have this with the Gospels. This is my, the point I'm making. So the verses are left to be interpreted by theologians. At least, for example, and I'll give you an example. John, John's theology is completely different to the synoptics. John viewed Jesus as the God of all gods on earth, the very God of God. John hasn't left anything uh, that would give you any other impression, for what example. What about, um, I misunderstood, you know, to my God and your God? Yeah. Did you say earlier they gave a different impression? Right. That... No. So... Yeah, so there John is saying my God and your God, that's, that's correct. But all the I statements, what are they from? Most hold, of them. Hold, hold, hold. I'm, I'm confused. Are you no. saying John does or does not? In all, John is viewed as separate. And there's a reason why he's viewed as separate yeah, from sure, the synoptics. Sure, sure. Because he attributes a lot of things that you don't find in the other Gospels. I and my father that's one. Fine. That's fine. I am the I, way. I, I'm, I'm just trying to pick yeah. up on. Yeah. So it sounds like a moment ago you said... John doesn't include anything that would give you the impression he's not God, but I thought earlier... No, John does. 
God does. makes Jesus the very God of God. That's what I said. Okay. Sorry, yeah. I thought you... Yeah. A yeah. few minutes ago, did you not say, I yes. could be wrong, that John does not leave in his gospel any impression that Jesus is not God? He, that he's nothing but... Okay, great. Yeah. But didn't you earlier try to quote John's gospel? Yes. Where Jesus says, I'm ascending to my God and your God, yeah. to suggest that John's gospel does contain something which contradicts it does the contain contradictory uh, statements, of course it does. So you're sticking with... Okay. Yeah. So I, it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't contain any... Uh, uh, contradictory statements. Okay, For example, I, all the if you ask, if I ask any Christian here, okay, we can do this experiment right now. If we ask any Christian to prove divinity from uh, the Bible, where do they go? The Gospel of John and the teachings of Paul. <laughs> they go to Paul or John, predominantly. Then, when you challenge them, then they go to Mark, Matthew, maybe. I don't, I don't deny that there are verses in Matthew and Mark and Luke that could be interpreted as attributing divinity to Jesus. I don't deny that. However, the, the Gospels that attribute the, the height, uh, Christology, uh, giving divinity to uh, Christ, is the Gospel of John. I, I'd, I'd concede, you know, John is more explicit, but I don't think a huge amount more explicit. I do think it, it's, it's quite clear at the other end. Because all the I statements are in John. I, I, I feel like, sorry, just to go back to where we were earlier. Um, you know, yes, with the Quran, you interpret it in the, in the light of the Hadith. I, I still stand by my final point that even given that, there are still some things that are not clear in the text that the Hadith don't clear up, and sometimes you get different Asbab al Nazul for the same things. Yeah. That, so they're still, and, and yes, the fundamentals like Tawheed, absolutely. Ta Tawheed yeah. is pretty clear. Although you know, there was a controversy in the early period about the eternality of the Quran, but let's. Yes. Let's That's put, a separate let's put that matter aside. from Allah. Let's, yeah. let's put, yeah. Well. That's separate from Allah. I, I would say that we don't say the Quran is the no, divinity. It was still divine. It was still held to be a challenge to, to Tawheed, how it fits in with Tawheed. No, it's not. It's, the, 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 the disagreement was whether the Quran was created or uncreated, but it was not, the dispute was not, was the Quran part of the divinity? No. So not in the, in the sense of being worse the, the, When I was taught about this, yeah. the impression I had been taught is the early Muslim theologians grappled with how to square this with Tawhid. So maybe you're right, yeah. maybe they said, look, no, it's, it's not divine. But given our definition of divinity, Tawhid, how does this fit? How does this not contradict? And the, the impression I got from my studies when I did it back then was the early Muslim scholar said, we affirm it's eternal, we affirm Tawhid, as how we reconcile them, bila khayf, without knowing how. Yeah. That's what I was taught, what I taught could be wrong, that's what I learned to make But then, you see, I'll tell you why that is to me, doesn't apply. For example, are we all born with the command of God? Sorry? us human beings are we born with the command of God if God didn't command us to be born we would not be born uh, each time if, if, if God had not ordained all of us to be born ordained is commanding okay, I fine. ordain unto all man a command I, okay. yeah, in, in Christianity but I think it's a different language right. yeah, if God had not ordained us all ordained means yeah, he has prescribed he has decreed that's what ordained sure, okay, means. Yeah. yeah. So without the decree of God, without the ordainment of God, would we have been here? No. Would you say the ordainment of God is eternal? Uh, this is the the, the, the level of uh, dispute that I'm talking about. It's nothing to do with divinity. I, who's, uh, I, I don't know much about this matter. Yeah. All I was taught. So may, maybe I, I accept that that was a challenge at the time. Yeah. yeah. So, so maybe they were wrong to have this discussion. Maybe it was always obvious. Always. I don't know. I don't know much about this. What story. I mean by that, that? All I know is yeah. the early Muslims. Yeah, they did. They felt this was a challenge to have. I know that. Okay. Uh, Imam Ghazali is one. Right. But what I'm saying is that these are fringe arguments anyway, that do not touch okay. the basics. I, I'm, I'm going to accept. Yeah, yeah. this is. Yeah, this is probably less important. Fringe arguments, yeah. It's less important than saying it's, it's just so, my, the, so going back to my point. So yeah, on, on Tawhid, yeah. um, yes, the Bible, sorry, sorry. The New Testament. The Quran is clearer about Tawhid than the synoptic gospels right. are about Jesus being divine. I'd say the Quran on Tawhid, I'd say the Quran on Tawhid, you know, it's like 95%. Yeah. Um, whereas the synoptics on Jesus being divine, um, the passage I quoted in isolation, 80-85%, overall I'm saying, you know, 90%. Okay. Especially when I understood in light of today. That's fair, the time. fair comment. But what I'm saying is, uh, 
I see uh, uh, a resemblance between the layout of the Quran, not the layout, the language of the Quran and the language of the Bible, especially in the Old Testament and some of the New Testament uh, verses. For example, in the Quran, anything to do with actions, Allah talks in the majestic we to show you his might. For example, can I, can I just jump yeah, in sure, there so we save time? Yeah. I don't appeal to read passages in the Old Testament necessarily for the Trinity. Yeah. In case that's no, 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 that's fine. Okay. But what I'm saying, the majestic we is implied. Oh, yeah. Salam alaikum. Salam. How are you? Salam alaikum. Alhamdulillah. So what I'm saying. Yeah. What I'm saying is, when it comes to actions, then you see the majestic we is placed to show might. The majesty but when it comes to worship that's not left to any ambiguous statement it's always singular form for example we, we spoke about Isaiah 45 I am Yahweh I'm the Lord I not we yeah and the Quran has said Quran has majestic we everywhere we reveal this Quran and we will protect it but no Muslim says there are more than one God but this is majestic we everywhere Allah says we will take them from here and do this that's we fine. destroyed them okay, but when it comes to worship matters yep. God does not leave anything ambiguous okay. he says what we so nobody can say yeah but he said us yeah, yeah. so you find this same method in the Old Testament the language is comparable okay. but when it comes to the New Testament there are verses like that but the majority of verses that you attribute to Jesus are neither in this manner, okay. the majestic we, nor in the singular form. So I, I think I've already conceded that they're less clear. Yeah. I still think it's um, you know uh, got, a, got a good level of clarity to be believed in, especially as I said that for, for us as Christians we don't just look at the Synoptic Gospels, we also look at John, we don't just look at the Gospels, we also look at the New Testament as a whole, which confirms our interpretation of the Synoptic Gospels, okay. portraying Jesus as divine. But then when we started the discussion, you were showing me a verse that shows the divinity of Jesus. Yeah. So we'll Mark go back 14. to that verse, it's Matthew 15, uh, it's 61, Mark, it's Mark 14, 61, 64, right. then Matthew 26. Would you say that that verse falls under the category that I mentioned? Ambiguous. Okay. Sorry, you're going to have to define ambiguous. Right. How much? No one... it's, it's ambiguous in that there's the possibility of interpreting Right, it. that's fair comment. But I would say it's, I would say the more natural interpretation um, is that it, it portrays the divinity. So because if you say natural, then you, now you're saying that you accept Jesus being divine from the mouth of his enemies.